morning and welcome to our Bible class this morning. We have a couple of minutes or just a, a few seconds yet before it's 1030, but uh, log on just a little bit early to give people time to log on before we actually get the class started. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we're looking in this series of lessons on how to study the Bible, an outline that I heard many years ago from a preacher in Alabama named Franklin Camp. Brother Camp was very uh, familiar with uh, people a generation or so ago, frequent speaker on the Freed Hardman lectureships and things such as that, and quite well known as being a very deep biblical scholar. I heard him do this 12 point outline on how to study the Bible. And he divided uh, things into these 12 sections. We've already looked at the first three of them. Now we began on the first morning looking, uh, actually the first lesson was kind of an introduction to the whole uh, series. And then the first point of the outline coming from Genesis chapters one and two, being the period of perfection. Now, when God created the heavens and the earth and he created all things that are in them. And then finally, he created the man and the woman. He placed them in the Garden of Eden. Everything was good, even very good. We pointed out that Genesis chapter one gives us the panoramic view of creation, whereas Genesis chapter two gives us the telephoto or the zoom close up view of creation. Then the second point of the outline from Genesis chapter three, verses one through 13, is the problem of sin. Uh, when the serpent tempts, tempted Eve, and she ate of that fruit and then she gave to her husband Adam and he also ate. Uh, things changed drastically. God had told them, don't eat of that fruit lest you die. They believed the lie though that Satan told them that you will not surely die. God just doesn't want you eating of that fruit because he knows that when you do, you will be like him, knowing good and evil. And when they ate of that fruit, they did indeed know good and evil. Up until that time, they had only known good, but it was their sin, their violation of God's will that made them aware of evil. And they were afraid they didn't want to be in God's presence like they had been before. They hid themselves. Then in Genesis chapter three and verse 15, the third point of this outline is the purpose of God. Once sin entered the world, God then revealed a purpose that he had a plan. And we pointed out that even in the New Testament, we find that the New Testament writers point back to the fact that things didn't take God by, uh, by surprise. Uh, God wasn't taken aback. He didn't have to scramble around and come up with something to do. But from before the foundation of the world, God had a purpose. And the purpose was that God would redeem mankind. So he reveals that purpose in Genesis chapter three and verses 14 and 15, when he's speaking to the serpent, uh, he's passing judgment on all those who were involved in introducing sin into the world. He begins with, addressing the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head, you will bruise his heel. Pointed out that the word seed, even though it's in the singular, is oftentimes used to refer to a plural. But in this case, it does indeed have a singular reference. Because if you'll notice, it's followed by singular pronouns, his and he. He will bruise your head, you will bruise his, Heal, referring to a certain individual who would come forth from the woman. He also pointed out that it was unusual to see this expression, the seed of the woman, and that it has reference to the fact that there is going to be one born, not in the natural way, but in a supernatural way. He's going to be born of a woman without the agency, without the aid of a man being involved in the conception process. And of course, this is fulfilled in the virgin birth of Jesus. We find then, and we didn't do the, deal with this in our last lesson, but as we continue looking at the next several chapters, we are reminded, and it's in, the impact of this sin is forced upon us. In Genesis chapter four, we read there of the killing of Abel by his brother Cain. In chapter five, we find the first genealogy in the Bible. And oftentimes we get distracted by the number of years that those people were living. 
what we ought to focus on is the repetition of the phrase, no matter how many years they lived, he died. The only one exception to that in that first genealogy, and that, of course, is Enoch, seventh generation from Adam, who walked with God, and the God took him. And he was not, for he had walked with God. And this is referred to also over in Hebrews chapter 11. But then as we go on through the next several chapters, we find that sin is so bad in the world that God de determines to destroy the earth with a flood. And he spares only Noah and Noah's family, his immediate family. Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives are taken into an ark that Noah was told to build and they were spared from the flood. Then as Genesis chapter 11, we see yet another rebellion against God. In Genesis chapter 3, the sin was wanting to be like God. In Genesis chapter 11, the sin is trying to get to heaven on our own. We can build a tower tall enough to go up into the heavens, and we can, in essence, dethrone God that way. Well, of course, we find there in Genesis chapter 11 that doesn't work either. And then again in chapter 11, we find yet another genealogy. And again, the repetition he died, he died, he died. We're reminded of the terrible consequences and effects of sin upon this earth and upon those living on the earth. So this brings us now to our fourth point. We're looking in Genesis chapter 12. We're gonna be looking especially the first three verses here in Genesis chapter 12. We're introduced to a man by the name of Abram, as he's called here. We find that later his name is changed to Abraham, and that's how most of us know him. So through this lesson and the remaining lessons, I'm not going to try to distinguish between uh, calling him Abram in his earlier part of his life and then Abraham later. I'll probably just refer to him as Abraham all the way through because that's how we know him. Uh, when we read here, though, we're uh, shown that he is called first, of course, Abram. And here we find in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and the point of this outline, this fourth point is God's promise of redemption. The promise of redemption. And here we find that God had said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred to your father's and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, if you'll notice, there are three main ingredients to this promise. One promise that has three, as one person says, three prongs to it. And the first prong has to do with the land. Get out of your father's house and get out of your country to a land or to the land that I will show you. Now, this promise is going to be repeated to Abram or Abraham several times uh, before uh, the, even the first part of this is fulfilled. But first of all, there's the land. He needed to leave Ur of the Chaldees where he had been living, and he needed to get to a land that God would show him. The second part of the promise has to do with making of him a great nation. In other words, not only is he going to have a large family, but it's going to be large enough that it's going to be called a nation and even a great nation, a large nation. Now, this is remarkable because as we continue reading uh, in the narrative here, we're going to find that Abraham was about 75 years old when he's leaving or of the Chaldees. And at this point, he doesn't even have a single child. Now, it's hard to have a, a large uh, progeny, uh, a numerous progeny, when you don't even have a single child yet, and especially when you're getting to the age that Abraham was. And yet Abram left his home in Ur of the Chaldees. He spent a time in Haran, and then he went on to the land of Canaan, which God showed him. Now, we need also to realize that even though this land is promised to Abram, it's really more promised to his descendants because Abraham lived in that land for many years, but the only parcel of land that he ever owned was the land that he bought in order to bury his wife, Sarah. He bought the cave of Machpelah and the field in front of it that was near the town of Hebron. He bought it from a Hittite 
and he bought it to bury his wife. Later, he himself was buried there, and then later several other family members were buried in that very cave. But that's the only part of the land that Abraham himself ever owned, and he bought it as a burial plot. But then the third part of the promise, there's the land, and then there's the nation. And the third part of the promise is that the spiritual blessing in you, all the families or all the tribes, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now later, this is going to be more explicitly said, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Remember, we saw that word seed back in Genesis 3 and verse 15 regarding the woman. Now it's going to be also through the descendants of Abraham. Now later, we'll find where the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16 makes a, a great point regarding the fact that this word is in the singular rather than the plural. He said, not to your seeds as of many, but through your seed, which is one, which is Jesus Christ. That's Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. So here, near the beginning of the Bible, clear back here in Genesis. We've seen in Genesis chapter three, the purpose of God. Now here in Genesis chapter 12, God's promise of redemption. And the redemption is necessary because sin is so great. Sin is so terrible. Left to ourselves, we are going to die. Now we will die physically, but we don't have to die spiritually. We don't have to die out of fellowship with God. And that's what God is promising to redeem us, to, to buy us back from this slavery of sin or uh, to sin in which we find ourselves. Now, as you study the rest of your Bible, all the way through the rest of the Bible, this promise to Abraham is, is in the, the foreground, you might say. I started to say in the background, but really it's in the foreground. Because everything else that you read in your Bible from Genesis chapter 12 onward is going to have something to do either with the land that God had promised to Abraham's descendants, or it's going to have to do with the nation that comes from Abraham, or it's going to have to do with the spiritual blessing that in his seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And as you're reading the rest of your Bible, as you're studying your Bible, keep in mind these three things and ask yourself, which one of these is in the foreground? Is this having to do with the land? Is this having to do with the nation? Or is it having to do with the spiritual blessing that is going to be found in the one individual who is to be coming from Abraham's descendants? Now, as we read through the rest of the book of Genesis, we're going to find that Abraham is going to try to help God. He's getting older. His wife is getting older. They're getting up in years where it's uh, not going to be easy for them to conceive a child and to give birth to a child. So Sarah gives to Abram or Abraham her handmaid, her Egyptian servant, Hagar. And Abraham has a child by her. And God says, I will bless him, but this is not the child that I promised you. I think we need to learn a lesson here that God doesn't need our help to fulfill his promises. He needs our cooperation to some extent, but he does not need us to take things into our own hands and do things in our own way and think that we can anticipate or perhaps even improve on God's plan. So later we find that Isaac was born and Isaac was the child of promise. And then Isaac, when he marries Rebekah, he has twin sons. God narrows it down to not the older one, which back in those days, the right of the firstborn uh, was something that was very jealously protected. Yet we find that it's not always in, Bible, uh, in the Bible the firstborn who has the greatest promises and blessings. And here we find that it's not Esau, the firstborn, but it's Jacob, the slightly younger twin brother of Esau, through, who this, through whom this promise is going to be made. And then Jacob, when he marries, he marries sisters, and then he also has their handmaids. He has a large family. He gives, he's the father of 12 sons. But we find in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10 that of those 12 sons, there's still yet 
another narrowing down process. And the narrowing down comes through the son Judah. And again, he's not the firstborn. Now, he's not the youngest either, but he's certainly not the firstborn. I believe he was fourth in line. But we find that Judah is the one to whom the promise is given that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So again, as you're reading in your Bible, remember that God has made a promise to redeem mankind from sin. The rest of the Bible is going to have to do either with the development of how the land is given to Abraham's descendants, or it's going to be talking about how these descendants become a great nation, or it's going to be talking about how one from that nation, one of Abraham's seed, becomes the one through whom God gives spiritual blessings to every family of the earth. We hope you'll join us again Friday morning at 1030 as we continue our series on how to study the Bible. Until then, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you.